So for this, uh, we have a dynamic panel that um, I'm going to invite to this, uh, invite to come on screen at this point in time. Um, Avery Ebron, who you already heard from, from the Guild out of Atlanta. Um, Malcolm Estrich, who's, uh, who has his own firm, CIC Wealth Management out of Washington, D.C. Um, and Albert White, a venture fund capitalist um, out of the D.C. metro area also too. Um, so if we can put Albert and Avery, I see Malcolm's on screen and we can get started with our discussion. Great. Gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for participating with us today. Uh, I hope you've been following the conversation. Um, Avery, you've been uh, pretty much a celebrity here. Uh, having participated on multiple panels, that's because of the great work you're doing down in Atlanta. But um, getting right into the topic, into the discussion, uh, one of the things that has come up in the previous sessions has been the issue around wealth. And what we wanna discuss here in this topic um, and I'm gonna ask you guys to give a little 90 second pitch about who you are and your background in a few seconds. Um, what we wanna get into is dive into that, what is really what are the, some of the issues, the challenges that historically that I'm quite sure we've all discussed in the past, but also too, what are some solutions we need to be looking at in terms of beginning to resolve some of these issues in the future. So part of the introduction, I wanna throw a little curveball um, two to three of you is besides telling us a little bit back about yourself, um, give me a vision of your idea of wealth. And I'm not talking about a definition, I'm talking about a vision. Because that's one thing when you talk about building wealth, you have to be able to be able to do is have a vision for it. So um, I'm going ahead, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and start with, with, with Al. Uh, <laughs> Cause Al, you know how to li liven things up and you know, and also to the opportunity for the perspectives here today. Um, we had the perspective from a boomer, from a millennial and from a Gen Xer. So this should be an interesting conversation also from that perspective. So, so Al, you wanna go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about you and the things that you've done, but more importantly, your, your, your vision of wealth. So um, most of my background has been in finance um, and business development, uh, originally from uh, New York City, Brooklyn, and uh, lived in Harlem, uh, went to school in Denver, and then came back to New York and went to Columbia Business School. Uh, so I've been involved in community development and economic development for really 40 years, besides the fact that I've been uh, advisor to about 20 of the top CEOs in the United States, African Americans mainly. Um, just recently, within the last year, I finished a book, uh, Race for the Net, uh, when African Americans control the internet. And one of the topics I discuss in the book is the whole aspect of black wealth. And my concern, when I first started writing the book and I got to this section, I was really astounded by the percentage gap between the black community and the rest of the population. In fact, uh, I was astounded how Hispanics now are starting to overtake um, the African-American community as it relates to wealth. So wealth, wealth in, in my mind goes back to what my mother used to tell me is, you know, save some money, put it in the bank because there may be a disaster and you may need that money. Um, I got some really good advice from my, my mom and from my parents on from their experience of what they saw over their lifetime, you know, seeing the stock market crash and seeing other disasters. And um, so today, um, I think when we talk about wealth, or when I think about wealth, I think about having enough resources um, to basically be able to deal with a disaster or a calamity uh, like we have today. And that now with the pandemic shows that the wealth level of the African American community, uh, because it was um, stripped uh, during the recession of 2008, 2011, we came into this new period with less wealth than we had before. And it really had hurt, her, hurt us and basically trying to maintain our businesses and our households and stuff. So I'll stop there um, and 
allow some of the other speakers as well. Okay, what I'm going to do this time, I'm going to throw it over to our wealth management expert, Malcolm, um, especially someone who makes his living, I have to say, very successfully in helping people build wealth. Um, give us, you know, not only your perspective on vision of wealth, but tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, sure. So as you alluded to, Tom, uh, and thanks for having me, everybody. Um, my primary role, I'm a certified financial planner. Uh, I'm also a, a partner in a wealth management firm based here in the D.C. area where I am. Um, and basically on a daily basis, I am working with uh, high earning professionals, helping them design a financial plan to determine how to check all those boxes we all have, right? Whether it's sending your kid off to college or purchasing your first or second or third or fifth home, whatever your heart desires, um, figuring out how to manage equity compensation is a big one that we get a ton because we work with a number of tech professionals, uh, just helping people really navigate the, the challenges that come along with uh, having more uh, more money than you do time a lot of times is the, the uh, problem, if you will, that we're trying to solve. Um, and so through that work, I, I, I have arrived at my own interpretation of what wealth is. And, and Tom, sort of to your point, the word wealth is a very heavy uh, word. It, it tends to intimidate a lot of people and scare a lot of people away from even trying. And so the words I, I prefer to use are either financial freedom uh, or time freedom right? Financial independence, sorry, or, or time freedom. And the reason I say it that way is because uh, wealth is really having the ability to own your time. You have absolute control over your time and you determine from the moment your feet hit the floor in the morning, how you're going to spend the hours you have available to you in that day. And people who are wealthy are not worried about going and physically trading hours for dollars to earn a living every day. Uh, and folks who are not are. And so to me, to answer that question more directly, my vision of wealth and, and the way that I'll know that it's time for me personally to retire is when the number of passive investments that I have happening outside of my day job are throwing off so much income that it outpaces how much I am earning by actively going out of the house and earning a living every day. Uh, at that point, I'll know that it's time to retire, right? And that's what, to me, uh, financial independence looks like. It's having passive income that comes in. This is a real estate conversation, right? Uh, so it's having passive enough income that is big enough that it replaces my, uh, my, my time, my, my labor work um, in exchange. That's, that's how I know. And last thing I'll say uh, on it, I've read, a, I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad probably 10 times uh, since college. And the very first thing that jumped out to me in that book the first time I read it. And one of the key tenets that I personally live by today uh, was the fact that once you learn how to use your brain to generate income opportunities for yourself or create income generating opportunities for yourself uh, and, and figure out how to use the things that are around you, the resources that are around you to create opportunities to earn income, uh, you can't unsee it. So as soon as you learn that skill and you learn how to create those passive income streams for yourself, uh, the problem that you will have that I personally have is you can never turn it off and you'll constantly try and find additional ways to add in that next passive income stream on top of it uh, because you just, you see it everywhere, uh, everywhere you look. All right. Avery. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, hard to our acts to follow, um, but I'll do my best. Um, so uh, my name is Avery D. Ebron. And um, my background as well is, although it not be as um, story as um, Albert and Malcolm, is in economic development, um, finance, um, social impact, and um, more now with the guild um, around community governance, community ownership of real estate. Um, and so I am the head of community products and operations at the guild. And um, just for some background, our mission is to build community wealth through real estate entrepreneurship programs and access to capital. And um, one of the main things that we're doing right now is our ground cover initiative where we're really focusing on seeding, um, developing and scaling co cooperative real estate models um, that sort of create pathways um, for folks in marginalized communities um, to build power, resilience and um, self-determination. And so I say all of that because um, I've worked really hard to try to align my daily work with um, actually this question, what my vision of wealth is. 
um because it's very important to me growing up um seeing folks um not have it in some of the um you know just the things in communities that with very talented people um in rough situations and um wanting to like you know make a difference and um so my vision for wealth is both individual and communal and so for me i really um look at wealth through a lens of autonomy um agency um similar to what has been said um but also the ability to self-determine um for yourself or for a collective group of people to self-determine on um, what what's going to happen in the near future and um not be dictated to um by external forces um, have no resilience against it. And so that's that's my personal vision for wealth. I, I really, I think it's a, I think for each individual and collectively is important to weave that together and for it to work in concert. And so um, my focus all the time is around how to, to you know, build community wealth, um, how to support ecosystem, solidarity ecosystem building, how can we, you know, implement democracy around asset and wealth building and community building? And at the same time, how can folks individually, as I said before, um, gain skills, gain abilities, um, gain just resilience themselves and collectively bound that together so that there's a communal wealth that's also taking place um, so that when something does happen, um, there are other folks who have your back and vice versa. And, um, and it can happen in a way that's not always competitive or winner take all, um, but together. And so that's my personal vision for wealth. And um, yeah, that's all, that's my takeaway. Yeah. Wow, very insightful. Because what I heard from Al was be prepared, Malcolm was be independent, and Avery was be resilient. And I think, with all of that from a perspective of looking at how we as a community, especially the black and brown community have been historically challenged, you know, there's been barriers that have inhibit us from really maximizing the potential to not only acquire wealth, but pass it on. So from the perspective of the three of you and just looking at historically what have been some of the challenges, what have those how have they impacted us? Because, I mean, ideally, the three of you really represent, you, you represent a small portion of the Black and Brown community that understands it and gets it and has a working knowledge to excel. But we'll begin to look at, I think it was Al who pointed out the numbers, you know, that there's, there's a significant gap just in terms of our ability to collectively understand not just how to obtain it, but scale it and then pass it on. So from the, that perspective and understanding the history and the challenges we've had in this country for building wealth, you know, how has that impeded us and impact us as a community, you know, overall? And whoever's, whoever wants to jump in first, feel free. Um, let, let me jump in first, because I want to talk about history. Yeah. And, um, you know, Tom and I have discussed this before. I grew up in New York. Uh, lived in Brooklyn uh, back in the 50s, 60s. Brooklyn um, um, was, the, was the mecca of uh, townhouses and Bed-Stuy. Um, in Harlem, we had buildings all over Harlem um, that needed to be renovated and uh, reconditioned. Uh, so we had a, a combination of things that happened in the early years. So um, in the early years, we had a lot of families that came into Brooklyn from the South and from the Caribbean. And they owned some very um, valuable properties in Bed-Stuy. Bed-Stuy, if those of you online who've never been to Bed-Stuy, uh, you need to visit there and see the townhouses and the brownstones in Bed-Stuy. Some of the most better hurry up in the country. Excuse me. I said they better hurry up if they're right. going to visit. So, 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 give you a little history. So, in the fifties and the sixties, black people controlled Bed Stuy, and gradually, what happened 
was when the uh, seniors and the family died, the children took over the property and it was almost like a free for all. You know, who could go and basically take their interest in the property and sell it uh, to an investor? And we started to lose a lot of those properties. We still have lost a lot of the properties in bed style today. bed style you walk through there like walking through Harlem. It's, you know, you, you don't really understand the history of, of what has happened there. But we lost a lot of value back there. We lost some properties that um, families sold for um, minuscule amounts of money that today sell for millions. And the same thing in Harlem. The, the thing in Harlem was we had dilapidated buildings in Harlem that black people didn't want to touch. You know, back in back in the 60s, I used to walk through Harlem and see all these buildings and nobody wanted to bother with the building. So there was one man um, in Harlem at the time, uh, Lloyd Dickens, who was a, a wealthier African-American who decided that the vision was Harlem was going to be great again. And he went and bought the buildings. And I think, Malcolm, what you talked about was the vision. Um, I think what has happened to us in those periods of time is we didn't have the vision of what our communities could be, so we gave it up. And we allowed other people to come in and take over some of the key uh, wealth aspects. And that's housing and an ownership of real estate is key to economic wealth. And so we, we transitioned from that. We went to the next phase in the 70s and the 80s, the, the late 70s and the 80s, we're now looking at a lot of people who are not from Harlem, not from Bed-Stuy, not from Five Points in Denver, moving into these communities, taking over, building up these, these houses, and spending a lot of money. Same thing in D.C., and we know that in D.C. is going on like that. So we gave up, it's almost, it's almost like we gave up the front. We gave up our real estate front, and we gave up our assets. As we went along, what happened was um, once the, the, the older people had passed, the whole transition of legacy was um, reduced. Um, and the next generation um, had very little thought about legacy. And I hate to say that, but we, we weren't thinking as much about how our children were going to do in the next phase. It was almost like, I got mine, you get yours, kind of going forward. And that hurt us because I remember growing up, my mom and my dad, and all of my friends, they used to get advice from their parents about, you know, how to save and, and what to do to keep wealth. And we lost that in the 70s and 80s. And even today, um, I think we have a problem of transferring that information, that knowledge. And we really need to do that. And then going back to what Malcolm said is, the future really is, is how we get our children to understand what wealth is all about and how to preserve it. Yeah. See, hey, hey, Al, hold that thought before we get there, because I want to talk about that a little later in line. Um, Al, um, Malcolm and Avery, I want to get your spin on the historical impact or things that were done or were not done that have really kind of impacted us and our ability to build legacy wealth in the Black and Brown community. I agree yeah. with uh, Al's point completely, but I think if we're going to talk history, I would go a little bit further back than the the 50s and 60s right i would uh, i won't even necessarily talk touch on reconstruction and be up bef before that and what all we know that that history to be i'll talk specifically right before the 40s i mean the 50s and 60s that i was talking about when uh parents and grandparents are coming home from world war ii and we all know about redlining we know exactly what uh that process was and what it robbed, you know, plenty of communities of. But what we don't necessarily talk enough about, we talk about uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, as if it was one uh, specific isolated event, right? The the, the uh, assault and terrorism that was uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, in that whole event, right? It's the hundred hundred year anniversary, so now everybody, every TV channel wants to show a, a documentary about it and finally uh, acknowledge it as if it's not. Uh, as if it's something finally that isn't just what Black people imagined and dreamed up and, and talk about and whisper it. Uh, in our communities, people are willing to finally acknowledge it 100 years later. But I, I would want to know how many other Tulsa, Oklahoma's there were around the country between 
the reconstruction, right? So we're now talking about like the 1860s, 1870s, up through, you know, maybe the 1940s uh, uh, when folks are coming home from World War II and trying to buy homes and those sorts of things, where you had these prominent communities of Black people, uh, uh, professionals, business owners, everything else who are property owners. And as soon as folks see that level of prosperity happening, they come in, they blow it up, they bomb it, they, you know, gun people down and everything else that happened in, in Tulsa that was doc documented. I, I can only imagine how many more of those places exist where those families were run out of town, literally, their property was stolen. And then there goes their families, their, their next generation's birthright. And we're once again starting that generational wealth building with Gen 1 all over again, where other people are having the opportunity to continue to pass the baton again and again and again, uh, we're having to start from scratch in that exact same race with each generation. And a lot of the reason for that, uh, Al, you made a very good point, and I I'm not taking anything away from that, but a very a very strong reason for that is because of the, the damage that was done both physically and psychologically to those initial generations who tried to rise up and, and have something for themselves and, and have something to pass along to, to those children. Avery. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of said, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the wealth of, of knowledge. So I'm going to try to round it out, and um, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump forward, but I'll, I'll give some context to the past too. And I think, um, while yes, redlining, um, racial housing policy, you know, by federal, state, local governments, you know, our denial into certain places or, you know, passing us into unhealthy um, sometimes situations. I think a lot of folks on this call understand that that took place at each level of government and with cooperation with um, local communities. I think it's easy to talk about back then, um, but it's important to also think about right now. And um, although redlining, you know, isn't quite the same, um, there, there are reports um, that it's still sort of taking place in a different way. Um, for example, um, there, there have been reports around, even when you control for a variety of factors like income, you know, the loan amount, the neighborhood, um, a black person um, is twice as likely to be denied for a home loan than a white person. And so no matter if they're making the same amount of money or whatever, and I think that goes back to the perception of risk argument that was in the previous um, conversation. But even like even with all of those things that have been said, the folks who are trying now to maybe stay in their neighborhood or um, acquire a home, it's tougher for them to get a home and they have to get it on worse terms um, or sometimes predatory terms. Um, and we've seen with the recessions, the result of that, um, I think in Philadelphia, um, you know, where you all are, it's actually the worst, um, which I think is around three times as likely to be denied for a home loan. And so there's a, a the reality is you need the resources. Um, if you don't have this wellspring of wealth or if it's been destroyed violently um, or through like this generationally, uh, you need financial resources and if that's denied, um, then home ownership, you can't get it. or you know, you're really extracting everything to do it. And so I think that's a big thing that we need to think about like right now in terms or recent history. I think the other thing too is that when we talk about folks who are selling their homes, um, my family, that, that example hit home because we had a property in um, Brooklyn um, and it was the same thing where, you know, you got 10 siblings and some don't want to sell it, some do. Um, you know, there's that argument going on, um, right, right in Crown Heights. So what I would say is even in those situations where we are acting in sort of the capitalist framework and selling the home, Black real estate, again, controlling for the same factors, you know, home quality, amenities, upkeep, is worth much less, um, up to like a 25% less the similar properties in white neighborhoods. And so there's a devaluing even of the wealth that you would be getting from selling it as a black person in your neighborhood. And so 
that's a big problem. Um, and from a financial standpoint, that affects what you can apply for. And were you to cash out, that affects what you can go do next. And so I think that's another aspect that we, that we to just add around it out with colors. There's definitely financial uh, mechanisms that are still in place um, and that have been in place throughout history to make the assets that we did have worthless. Um, and when we were to move off of it, be worthless. And if we, even if we were to want to get back into those neighborhoods, it's just tough and harder to get in. And so I think that's important context as well. Hey, Tom, if I may really quickly. Yeah, please do, because that was a great observation on every part, which allows us to flow through in terms of looking at, you know, what do we should be thinking about and just in terms of today's climate to really, you know, change the thinking. But go ahead, Malcolm. I want to say something to actually bring together the the picture that Avery just pointed and the the point that I was making before about like sort of just giving it up. Right. And I think part of the challenge that that has to be solved. This is me putting on my my, my financial planner hat. Uh, part of the challenge that has to be solved is Gen 1 that went through the trouble of purchasing that property in New York that Avery's talking about, where you've got all these different uh, inheritance who, are, who stand to, to, to someday have an ownership right in that property. Making sure that the, the proper documentation is in place in the form of a trust or a will or whatever else to make sure that uh, you save them from themselves, right? So you as Gen 1, the property owner, you did the hard work. You you put the money together to buy the property. You paid the mortgage or whatever along the way. And you did the hard work of acquiring that property. Do the one more less hard step of putting it to paper, putting documentation in place to make sure that your hard work doesn't go in the trash. Because to Avery's point, the moment folks start bickering over what are we going to do with this property, how can I get my money, all that kind of stuff, it, it brings lawyers in, which then means money is going out the door instead of the people it was intended to. And then it also like creates an issue where you no longer have the ability to, to take the baton, like I just said, and pass it to your next generation the way it was intended to. And so by just doing that one extra thing and putting your, your plan down on paper, working with a professional working with an estate attorney and, and making sure that your wishes are known and also kind of putting some handcuffs on it if you know there's some some contention there that's how you keep the neighborhood from turning the way that Al was talking about and that's how you keep from having that conversation decades later about they took this from us because they didn't necessarily take it right you you just left the, you left out a step so we just got to do it a little better now let me mention this term in my family we own property uh in mississippi and my brother um and the older members of our family created a corporation and so after our parents died their uh kids um basically felt that it'd be better for us to have a corporation and to split up the shares so that any income that came out of the property could be shared among the family and that really protected us uh, but also it protected us in someone saying, I want to sell the property next to grandpa's house. And, no, and the other people were saying, no, we can't do that. But now we have a structure that allows us to vote on what's for the best interest of the, house, of the family, but also for the legacy and the kids coming late. And I think um, what, what Malcolm is saying is absolutely correct. There's a lot that needs to be done on the legal side to basically bring families together and get them to understand that it's better for us to settle in a meaningful way than to pay all these lawyers all this money to, to basically fight our case. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're spending lots of money for, for lawyers on both sides to come in and basically tell us what we need to be doing. Yeah, and interesting, I'm glad you guys brought that up because it all, it, 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 it all is, you know, perfect common sense if you understand it, but somehow that knowledge was lost in, in a lot of families and a lot of generations because we see gaps that have been created and we see neighborhoods decline. And one of the problems we have in Philadelphia is what we call bad titles. And what you have is a lot of property um, in Philadelphia um, that a lot of times end up in sheriff's sale or end up being acquired by speculators that, you know, grandma died and left the house to you know, you know, to Aunt, to, to Aunt Sarah who died and left the house to her son Jamil and 
There was never no title transfer. You know, there's never no legal documentation. And what happens is even the utility bills are still in grandmom's name, even though they're getting paid. So what happens is, is that all of a sudden you have this property that you've been living in that's been in your family for three generations, but you can't even go out and get equity loan to maintain the upkeep and the maintenance. And right. what happens? A lot of people end up just walking away or a lot of people end up just, you know, you know, selling it as speculators or flippers, you know, you know, at, at, a, at, a, at a loss and it happens community wide. And, you know, and so what is it that has to happen in our community for this, for this problem to one, be corrected, but also two, we become better educated and understanding, you know, that an asset is critical to not just for us, but for our children. What's missing guys? And what should we be doing differently? Well, one of the things I mentioned before is, is education of our children and um, our young people. Uh, I think the, the point that Malcolm brings up about the whole literacy, financial literacy, and teaching our kids. My, my, my oldest daughter has a financial literacy program she runs in New Jersey to teach kids how to manage their money. We have to do more of that. Um, I think um, what has happened that the gap after the 80s up until really the 90s, there was you know more thought given to how do I survive from day to day and not that transfer of, of, of wealth and equity to, to our children. And I think we really need to start focusing more on giving advice, not holding it back. You know, so, so Malcolm's in the business, but I think a, a number of us that have the skills and the background, Avery, I'm sure has the skills and background, that when he meets a family is to be able to say to them, have you done a trust or have you put together ownership um, uh, title papers to make sure that you own the property? I'm right now in, in a situation where a person died, he, he didn't have a, a will, he didn't have a, a, a trust, and now we're dealing with the kids and we're trying to figure that out. And, um, and he was a very educated person. So I think there's gotta be a lot more education um, on a number of different levels, you know, one, you know, on the church level, on the school levels, we got to really start talking more about how we protect our assets. Well, I'll, I, I think the education piece is important, but I also think it's a messaging thing, right? So I think about my own family for a second. My mom worked for 30 some odd years as a registered nurse. She's not a finance person, but she saved up and bought a, a, a plot yeah. of land in North, in North Carolina where our family is from. And from the time I was probably five or six years old, I had been getting the messaging that was, I worked my butt off to be able to afford this. You and your sister, when the time comes and you inherit this, you better not sell my land. So it wasn't, you know, I'm going to wait until you're a grown adult or I'm going to wait until I'm a senior citizen to message this to you that this is what my plan is. It was literally from like the time that I can remember my earliest memory of, of this particular land and our conversations about this particular place in North Carolina, it was always, if you sell my land, I will come haunt you for the rest of your day. So you better not say. And so like when the day comes, my sister and I already know the plan. Like we don't have to have any kind of contentious conversation or we don't have. And so I think part of it is just very simply reinforcing the importance to your kids and being willing to include your kids in the conversation uh, to make sure that the things that you desire to happen are actually what happens. So yes, you know, some of what we're talking about, the mechanics and the legalese and the everything else and the know-how is very important. I don't want to knock that down at all, right? But I think another component of that is the part that we just don't ever want to talk about our money. We don't ever want to talk about what we own and what we have and what's going to happen and all those kind of things. But uh, frankly, the little, the, 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 the lesser you share, the lesser your kids know, the more likely they are, they are to just blow through it when they get it because they don't respect it. They won't value it the same way that you did. And you can't necessarily expect them to if you consider the fact that they never really got any instructions when it, when it came to them, right? They just, they got it. They didn't know what to do with it. The first person to come along with a good idea, they took it and ran with it. So it's up to us as the people who are, you know, seeding that you know, first generation of wealth creation, it's up to us as those people to have that conversation with the inheritors of that wealth to make sure that they understand what responsibilities they have once it does come to them. Yeah. Avery, what are your thoughts on what Malcolm just said? 
Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, from the just from the familial aspect, um, there's so much work to be done there. I guess I'm. I just want to maybe take another angle to to round it out, and um, and maybe I'll use an example um, to illustrate. So while I I, I agree, um, I think a lot of what we're talking about has been done with intention. And there are capacity constraints on folks. Like, it just is what it is. I grew up with a single parent. And um, I, I mean, I had a conversation last week about this because this same issue was happening with another property and around like, well, how are we gonna deal with it down the line? But I think there's a, a capacity issue when you just try to do it alone that a lot of folks just won't be able to deal with. And so, I'll just go back to the community wealth building um, aspect of things where you, there's that individual wealth building, but there's also community wealth building. And I think similar to Tulsa and maybe Auburn and Atlanta, um, folks did it collectively and together. And I think we have to take that same approach and strategy, especially given the intent and the structure and the system in which we're trying to operate. So in, in Atlanta, what we're doing is we have a, we bought a property outright and the community is going to own it. Um, and so as they're getting that opportunity to own, like the education piece, the messaging piece, all that is rolled in, real estate education, um, financial literacy, um, that's really important. But the other piece is providing community capacity so that when these things pop up, you're not on your own to deal with it but as a collective ecosystem of resources so we can actually like mobilize what we're saying. And it's not just one person, but we're doing it together. So I think setting up organizations, institutions, um, this community uh, resilience and uh, just cooperation and setting up opportunities like maybe land trust that can purchase properties and keep them affordable and make sure that folks in certain areas are able to still get back in. Um, things of that nature also come to mind because they just add capacity and tools at a community level to actually make sure this happens. I think in, in congruence with um, the, the family aspect and the education. You know, Avery, so if I understand you correctly, what you're really talking about is, is that how do we take the understanding um, that Al mentioned in the messaging that Malcolm pointed out and institutionalize it. And to be able to institutionalize it, you got to be able to put in, you got to be able to be able to put in processes and systems that allow these institutions to not only figure out how to apply it, but align it and make it work, and then have you know stakeholders and partners to support it. So what kind of stakeholders and partners, what I'm question I'm throwing out to the group, what kind of stakeholders and partners do we need to be um, engaging with you, to work with us in terms of rebuilding wealth or, or building wealth in the black community and really looking at it in a very meaningful way that we have, we make a real dent, you know, in the wealth gap, which just seems to not only just continue to grow, but just continues just to um, be representative of the issues we often see coming out of communities every day when we watch the six o'clock news. So who are the partners, who are the stakeholders that you know need to be a part of this as we begin to look at how do we remessage, how do we educate, and how do we institutionalize wealth building in our community? I think the point that you brought up about partnerships um, is, is really key. I think what Avery's doing in Atlanta um, Avery, back in the, the days of the um, of heyday of Brooklyn, we had Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration, which you might have remembered. And what they were doing was going around and pulling together neighborhoods and community groups to buy properties. And I think, you know, if you individually can't buy a property, don't be put off by um, a structure where it's a partnership with some other people. And that's what goes on a lot in the United States. And I'm sure Malcolm's seen this in a lot of other groups. They come together, they get, they get their money together, they sit down at a table and they say, okay, I don't have much, but I got something to put into the deal and let's buy this block up. And that's what I've seen in DC. All, a lot of these blocks have been done through partnerships and relationships. So I think we need to start 
thinking about how as a group, we can basically come together and, and uh, build some wealth through some partnerships and relationships. That, that's my thought. Yeah, and I, I, oh, sorry. No. The one thing I would add to that is just that there's a lot of money out there right now facilitating those opportunities, right? Absolutely. Like the, there's no question that uh, post, I can't remember what month it was, but post uh, uh, Brother Floyd's uh, televised murder last year, like a lot of people have pushed a whole lot of money out there to say, we're sorry to the black community, right? And so it's created this opportunity that I don't know how much longer it's gonna last, but it is in existence right now. And so I think folks better grab it while they can. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for, for banks and mortgage companies and lenders and folks like that that have pushed a lot of money out there into the system to help grease the skids for people wanting to invest in things like real estate and even venture capital and everything else. So I would say, you know, be willing to do the homework and do the research to find out who is offering money in those specific places uh, and be willing to, to spend the however much time it takes to you know, write the grant proposal or the, the fill out the application to apply for it, uh, to take in those dollars to help seed your, your first you know, real estate investment or your, your uh, cooperative, you know, your group or whatever you formed that is looking for those right. dollars. Be willing to do that work to uh, apply for those dollars because I don't know how much longer they'll be there. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, there has been a lot of promises, but I mean, part of the challenge we've often heard in terms of the, the Black community, promises have been made before to how much of it actually turns into reality. Only time will tell. But one thing I think we all can agree on that the window is short and we have to, we, we have to be willing to be assertive and not just looking at where the opportunities are, but challenging people on their commitments, which we have seen. So we have really, you know, uh, two minutes left, guys. I just want to get final thoughts from the three of you. I mean, thank you for a very dynamic and interesting and insightful conversation. And of course, when you have speakers like yourself, questions have a tendency to go in a different direction, which is just which has been which has been wonderful to see. And I thank you for that. But. Um, uh, closing comments, 20 seconds. Um, Avery, start with you. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'll go by answering that previous question. Um, I think the first institution to engage is the community. Um, and it should start from a grassroots um, place. Albert, you mentioned community groups being the folks buying the property. I think that's the first inst institution. And I, I would say anchor institutions who are doing work um, in community, um, hospitals, things of that nature, we're gonna stay there. Also important to engage. I, I think just lastly, um, acquiring and having community on real estate is key. Um, and as a great signal to folks who have individually on real estate, how they can move forward. So I think Avery, that's the Avery, I'm gonna have to cut you, Gary, run out of time. Right. Albert, final comment. Yeah, my, my big push is uh, educating our, our children. And uh, if you don't know the information, find it, let them know. Also talk to them about this period. This is a historical period and what happened during this period because I think they'll learn a lot from um, how people dealt with a pandemic and, and, and basically what they had to do if there's another pandemic. Okay, Malcolm, 30 seconds. I'm gonna steal Al's theme of education and just say, be willing to invest in your own financial education, right? We spend tens of thousands of dollars to go off to school and get these fancy degrees to get jobs to pay us more money than we'd be able to earn without the degree. And then we don't invest a dime in our financial education to tell us what to do with the money once we've got it. So that would be the place I'd say to start. Gentlemen, thank you for a very <laughs> wonderful and enlightening and empowering conversation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my next panel, um, my, my next panel moderator um, for our next session. Again, thank you, gentlemen. And also to everyone who's attending these sessions, remember, uh, please complete the survey and you can find it in the chat.